Okay, so at this point of the game, uh, we've just finished a month flyby. We have a lot of science, and we have a lot of different options. If you go into mission control, the next contract you usually get is going to be to rendezvous two vessels. Uh, sometimes it'll actually also have this dock uh, parameter tagged onto it, depending on whether or not you've actually unlocked the docking port in the tech tree. Uh, if you have, that's pretty good, because then you can do both of these at once. However, we're not going to do that one, because rendezvous is kind of a tricky topic. Um, you can do it, but it's actually going to be way more beneficial in terms of science progression to go to Minmus. Not Mun, we're going to Minmus. And there's a couple different reasons for that. Um, Minmus is a little bit further away, and it's, it's an inclination, so it's a little bit harder to get to. Uh, but the gravity is way lower, so it's much, much, much more forgiving in terms of uh, landing difficulty. And uh, the actual total dB requirement for getting there is a little bit lower than mud because of that lower gravity. And that means you can actually hop around to a couple different, different biomes on Minmus uh, to get a lot more science. Uh, and then the science that you get from Minmus, because it's farther away, it's actually a little bit more valuable than the science from Mun. And then finally, uh, we've already gotten science data from high and low Mun space uh, on the previous flight. So the only new science that we can get is actually from the Mun surface. If we go to Minmus, we're going to get science from three different situations. We're going to get science from high Minmus space, low Minmus space, and the surface. And then ideally, several biomes from the surface. So Minmus is a much better choice in terms of progression. If you want to do this rendezvous contract, or if you want to go to Mun instead, that's totally fine. You can do it. Um, the rocket that I'm about to build can probably land on Mun as well. Uh, you're just going to have to be a little bit more careful landing, and you probably won't be able to hop between multiple biomes. Right, so we're actually oh, not even going to take a contract for this flight. Nope. We do need new parts, though. If I could remember what they were. Yes. No, I remember what they were. We need, we need uh, to go this way. And you can't research things over 160 until you upgrade uh, the research and development building. So we're going to do that. Can I upgrade this one? No. OK. So on this flight, um, we're actually going to want to take a scientist with us because, like I said before, there's going to be three different biomes or three different situations, and ideally maybe even like up to five different situations if you can put all the biomes uh, that we can do science in. And we really, really want to take a scientist so that we can reset those experiments that can only be run once. Uh, if we didn't do that and we wanted to run like five different uh, science juniors, we would have to take five science juniors with us. If we take a scientist, we only have to take one science junior with the rocket, and then the scientist can reset it. Uh, however, scientists can't do, can't use SAS. The solution to that problem is these probe cores. So this hex probe core, if you look over here, it says uh, remote pilot assistance available. That means that it can do, uh, oh no, it's actually here. SAS, Stability Assist, and it can do prograde and retrograde hold. So this probe core is basically as good as a level one pilot in terms of SAS modes. The other wrinkle here is um, the pilot is actually what lets you do maneuver nodes. And if you don't have a pilot, you can't do maneuver nodes unless you have a probe core and a communication signal. So we're going to need to make sure we have an antenna on here. But yeah, so we need to buy uh, precision engineering so we can have that probe core. And then we're also looking for new science experiments. And there's actually two that are in here that are really good. There's the magnetometer boom. Uh, this is an experiment that, experiment that can only be run from space, but it's very valuable. And then the seismic accelerometer, this is an experiment that can only be run on the surface but it also is worth a lot of science. So if we take those two, uh, 
you can run the magnetometer boom in a lot of different situations. We have low curve in space, high curve in space, uh, high minimum space, and then low minimum space. And then the seismic accelerometer we can actually do on the launch pad, and then again when we land, and in each biome where we land. This, these two are going to get us a lot of science. Okay, and then we don't even have enough to buy any of the rest of these, but I don't think we need them at this point. Okay. So the VAB is still at level one, uh, and we don't have enough money to upgrade it. That's fine. We can actually do this with only 30 parts. It's a little bit challenging, but not impossible. Uh, I think it seems like I lost my last um, rocket, but that's fine. Now remember, uh, previously we removed the monoprop to save weight, so we'll do that again. And we'll have our heat shield down here. Oops. And remove the ablator to save weight. You don't need it when you're just returning from uh, within the Kerbin system, or really anywhere. With a ship that's light, as light as we're building, you don't need it. Okay, we have a lot of science. Hmm. So one thing you could do, we're going to use the science box again because we're going to be transferring science back and forth a lot. Uh, this just makes things convenient. It's not necessary, but convenient. There's actually one trick that this enables that I'll show later uh, where you can double up on certain experiments that don't give full credit for their first run. We could stick all this stuff on the outside of the pod uh, it's going to start getting a little bit draggy and possibly even explodey uh, for re-entry. So we're going to use the service bay for the first time. And this will protect your equipment uh, you know, on re-entry or ascent. Uh, unfortunately, it opens sideways. I like to have this oriented so that uh, the door is open when you EVA, because you're going to have to be right-clicking on stuff in here occasionally. Uh, so if you put it like this, it works better. The things we want to put in here, we need our probe core. Uh, so the Octo and the Hex. The Hex is actually better. You can kind of tell by the price. So the Octo has SAS, but it doesn't have probe retrograde holds. Um, we're just going to use the Hex. Those are, those are useful. We're just going to stick it in there. Um, one thing about probe cores, uh, they drain power over time, and they're just always draining power because, you know, they're computers, they have to run. There's a mode called hibernation, which reduces the electricity usage for the probe core and basically shuts it off. It doesn't totally eliminate the, the usage, but it does reduce it significantly. There's an option here called hibernate and warp, and I don't know why this isn't default, but it really should be. Uh, you want to turn that on. And what that does is anytime you're time warping, uh, the probe core is just going to hibernate automatically, which is going to sh save a lot of power. Okay, so we got to put our, all of our science in here. Um, so we're, because we're going to take a scientist, we only need one mystery goo. Now, mystery goo does have a weight to it. Um, a lot of the experiments, even though it says that there's a weight, I'll show this actually, this is kind of cool. Um, so this says it's 0 0.005 tons. But there's a special flag on certain parts that tells the game just to add that weight to whatever it's attached to. And the game will not tell you which parts have that flag and which parts don't. I happen to know that the mystery goo has this flag, or no, sorry, does not have this flag. Um, and the way you can tell is if you take the part and you kind of move it around over some other part, if you turn on the, the center mass down here, the center mass is going to move around as you're hovering over it. And that's how you know that the position of this part actually is going to change the center mass of your rocket. Right? So we want to make sure that those are balanced. If you take a part like this one and you move it around, the center mass doesn't move. And that's because the mass of this part is actually just getting added to the, to the, probe or the command pod. Um, and it doesn't matter where you put it in terms of mass distribution. So the, the magnetometer boom, and I call that out because the we want one mystery goo and one magnetometer boom. These two happen to be the same mass. Uh, this one also affects the center mass, and so we're just going to put these opposite each other so they're going to balance out. Just like that. 
Okay, we're gonna want a thermometer on here somewhere. Right there, and then our seismic accelerometer. Right there. Um, oh, I wanna show one more thing, just something that messes people up a lot. So th this is a really common configuration for a rocket. You, wanna, you have your command pod, your service bay, your heat shield. If you put the heat shield on like this, uh, there's something about the collider on the bottom that makes it really, really hard to, or impossible actually, to attach things to the bottom. I can't put the Mr. U in there. Uh, so if you're, if you're building out something in a service bay, you want to take the heat shield off, and then you're able to attach things. Second note here is that if you have uh, angle snap turned on, stuff attached to the bottom of the, the service bay is going to be upside down. Uh, you can either turn angle snap off, that's the C, the C key, or just click that button. Um, it's going to fix that. Or you can actually, with angle, angle snap on, you can hit S or W twice to flip it over. It's a, just a weird gotcha. Okay, so we're going to put that back in there. Sort of. Slap that on there. Make sure the blader's gone. Now for power, um, I'm going to put one of these batteries in here. Normally I like to use solar power, uh, but because the VAB isn't upgraded, we're limited to 30 parts. And the four solar panels that we're going to need uh, probably won't cut it. So I'm just going to take extra, just a, a large battery. You can probably do it with one solar panel, just as long as you make sure that you're always facing towards the sun. I think this is going to be enough. And then remember, uh, before I said uh, we're going to need an antenna so that we can use maneuver nodes. These first two antennas, the Communitron 16 and the 16S, they actually have exactly the same strength. They're both 500K antennas. But one of them, the 16S, is, is three times heavier than the 16. The only real dip, there's two real differences here. Um, well, three. The mass is one. Uh, they're the same strength. The Communitron 16 has to be extended, so when you place it, it won't be functional until you actually click the extend button there. The 16S is always active. You don't have to do anything with it. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you how many missions I have failed because I forgot to extend an antenna. It's, it's way more than one. It's probably way more than five. It's probably way more than ten. Uh, it's really easy to forget that. So sometimes just the convenience of the 16S is nice, um, even though it weighs more. Uh, the other thing is the 16S is way more resilient to aerodynamic forces. Uh, the 16 will, if, you, if this is extended and you're re-entering, uh, this will break off. Usually not a big deal if you're re-entering anyway, uh, but just something to remember. But I'm going to use the lighter one, and I hope I remember to extend it. anything? No, I don't think so. Okay, so we're going to close that service bay. Uh, the tip of the antenna here is sticking out. It doesn't actually matter. The physics of that thing are not quite as big as the render model. Close that. All right. What's interesting here is we've actually almost used half of the parts we have available just on the science package and not even the whole science package. So we're going to slap the Science Junior on there, and um, if you remember from the other videos, I'm not going to try to recover that because the heat tolerance is so low. Uh, we're just going to constantly move the data up to either the storage box or the command pod. Oh, and then again, um, I generally like to move the parachute over to the decoupler stage so that these two just activate at the same time. So as soon as we stage off the rest of the rocket, the parachute's going to be armed. You just don't have to think about it anymore. Next up, fuel tank. And if you'll remember from the previous videos, uh, if you click down here, you can see the burn time. About two minutes is a really good target for your liquid stages. So that's our upper stage. And then again, uh, I put the engine along with the decoupler from the stage below it. 
I think it's time to show the DV map. Right. So we talked about this a little bit before. Um, your rocket has a total amount of delta V, which is based on the uh, efficiency of your engines, the ISP, and how much dry mass you have, which is like things that aren't fuel. Uh, so like tanks and command pods and science and engines and storage base and heat shields and all that stuff, all that is dry mass. Everything that's not fuel is dry mass. Uh, and also it's based on how much fuel you have, the wet mass. Um, the DV map, there are established amounts of DV you need to spend to do certain maneuvers, right? So it is known that to go from, for example, uh, low MUN orbit, which is the, I can't point to it, but it's the circle on the gray line, on the MUN line. So to go from that circle to the, the far left, which is landed, costs 580 meters per second of DV. Uh, so you can budget for that. You, if your rocket doesn't have enough DV, like on the pad, if you're just sitting there on the pad, it's like, well, I only have, I have 5,000 meters per second of DV, I know that a um, on landing and return costs 6,000, like, I won't be able to do it. You can make really good predictions if you know how to use a DV map. You don't have to just guess and check by adding fuel or adding engines or, or whatever. So we're going to Minmus. And the way this works is you're just going to add up the numbers along each leg. So uh, 3,400 is the amount that it takes to get to low curve in orbit. And then 930 is the amount that it's going to take to get a Minmus encounter. Now, you'll notice that there's a number just above the 930, the 340, um, and that's a plane change. So Minmus is actually at a, a tilted angle, and the amount of dB you have to spend to get to that plane, uh, that angle, is, can change depending on how you do it. On the map here is showing us the maximum value that it should possibly cost. Usually you'll, you'll be able to do it for much less than that. Um, but just taking the max number is actually kind of a good way to get a good safety margin in your rocket too. So I'm going to add up 340, the, the full number. Uh, and then we're going to add 150, which is the number to go from an encounter to low minimus orbit. And then we're going to add to 180, which is the number to get to the minimus surface. So that totals, if I did my math right, 5,000 meters per second dV. And that's to, to get to the minimum surface. Now to get home, we need 180. We just follow the numbers backwards. So we need 180 to get up to low minimus orbit. And then 150 to get uh, an escape to, that will hit the curb and atmosphere is we're going to be aerobraking. All we have to do is just escape Minmus and get the periapsis at Kerbin low enough to hit the atmosphere, and then we'll get home. We don't need to spend the 930. The 930 would represent the dV that we would need to go back to a low circular Kerbin orbit. But we're not doing that. We're just hitting the atmosphere. OK, so that total is 5,330. And just for reference, like the equivalent uh, amount of DV you would need to land on the MUN and get home is about 6,000. So it's like 700 cheaper. Okay. And remember, um, when you're talking about DV, we're always talking about vacuum mode. And you need to click the DV button here at the bottom and switch to vacuum mode. Oh. Uh, let's turn that off. Yes. Okay. Right. You click the DV button at the bottom and switch to vacuum mode. And now you can see how much DV that stage has when it's not in the atmosphere. The atmosphere makes engines less efficient, and so it reduces the dV. Um, but we only really care about vacuum mode dV. So that has 2,070. We're shooting for 5,330. Probably a little more, because we, we know we want to do um, a couple biome hops. And we just want to have a safety margin. So like 6,000 is probably a good target. OK, so that's a pretty good start at that stage. And now we'll do another stage, probably a swivel. I happen to know what this is going to end up looking like, um, but I will go through the design process anyway. Right. So this is vacuum mode. Uh, we have 40, roughly 4,500. That's not enough. We need more. And then secondly, remember, if you check the sea level uh, thrust weight ratio, 
1.15 is too low. So we're going to add some boosters. One thing um, that was suggested that I mentioned, uh, I, I mentioned before, you want to put your boosters on the north and south side of your rocket so that as you're turning to the east, you're not going to run into them. Um, there's another technique that helps avoid booster collisions, and that is to make sure that the decoupler is in the top half of the booster. When this decoupler fires, it's going to push the booster away from the rocket. Right now, it's right in the middle of the booster, and that's probably going to be OK. Um, if the booster rotates, if it rotates inwards, then it's going to hit the rocket and probably destroy one of these fuel tanks. So you want to make sure that it rotates. If it's going to rotate, you want to make sure that it rotates outwards. And the way you do that is use the Move tool. So you can click this button up here. Um, also, the, the number keys on the keyboard correspond to these four buttons, so like the number keys one through four. So you can do one for place, two for move, three for rotate, four for reroute. So you press two or click that move button there. Uh, we're going to take the booster here and we're going to slide it down a little bit. Not a lot. Maybe put the boost, put the decoupler in like the top, you know, three quarters, two thirds, roughly. Um, and then I'm going to switch back to place mode. I'm going to grab that decoupler. I'm going to put it back so that the bottom of the boosters is roughly even with the, with the swivel engine. Okay, so now you can see that when the decoupler pushes that booster away, it's going to rotate outwards. Um, and so it's less likely to hit the center core. You don't want to put that all the way to the top. If you, put, if you put the decoupler all the way to the top, then it's going to push rotate really hard, and the bottom of this thing might actually hit the swivel. You don't want that to happen. Okay, I'm going to put the swivel again, like we did before, uh, to fire alongside the boosters, because the boosters do not have any kind of control authority, and the swivel does. The swivel is what's going to keep us stable. Okay, sea level thrust weight ratio, 2.25. That's a little bit on the high side. Um, you can go over two if you're using SRBs, because the burn time is so short. Those things are going to burn for only 42 seconds and then they're going to be gone, and then we're going to be up here on this stage with a 1.4 thrust variation. That's actually pretty high, too. Once you start getting up in your stages, you don't need as high of a thrust weight ratio. So what this is telling me, which is lucky because I need more dB, I think. Yeah, so we're only at 5386. Um, if your thrust weight ratio is too high, a really obvious thing you can do is just add more fuel. Right? Put that back down there. Okay, vacuum mode. We're at 58.87. So that's, a, that's definitely over the target of 53.30. Um, I was kind of hoping for 6,000. Let's, let's see how the rest of this works. Sea level 1.96. That's still on the high side. Um, that's more reasonable. And then the second, once the boosters decouple, it'll be at 1.04. Mm. I might be able to get away with one more fuel tank. Let's see here. Ah, we have one part left. Okay. 1.84 thrust to weight on the pad. And that's the sea level, yeah. Okay. And that's that's great. Uh, 0.91 in the second stage, that's fine. Total vacuum DV, 6,079. Exactly 30 parts. Oh, one thing I didn't talk about. <laughs> you might have noticed. Uh, this is a Minmus lander, but there are no landing legs here. Uh, the gravity on Minmus is so low that you don't need landing legs. And in fact, they sometimes just like get in your way because they'll bounce you up into the air. Um, you can land this rocket perfectly fine just on the engine or even on its side and you'll be totally okay. Uh, one of the reasons I'm going to Minmus is because we still have this 30 part count limit and it's kind of difficult to build a lander in 30 parts with all of your science stuff 
if four of those parts have to be landing legs, if three or four of those parts have to be landing legs. So I'm just going to go to Minmus instead and forget the landing legs. Don't worry about it. Right? Okay. We're at 30 parts. Um, don't forget to set up the uh, EVA signs. Oh, and the crew. Right? We want, we want our scientist in here. We want Bob. Go to the cargo section. Uh, and remember, don't use the Mark 1 command pod inventory slot. There's a bug. It'll get lost. Don't do it. Just use, just replace his parachute. Alright. I think we're good. Let's go. Okay, remember, uh, there's that seismic experiment in here that we can do on the surface, so we can do that now. Um, as long as you have, so it's really hard to actually find the thing. As long as you have advanced vehicles enabled, so if you remember you go to settings and then scroll down to advanced vehicles right here. Uh, this adds the aim camera button. So you can right click on a part, you click aim camera, and now the camera is centered on that part. So you can easily zoom into the uh, service bay here. So we're going to log our science data. Cool, six science. Uh, and then next, because we upgraded the R&D building, we actually have surface samples unlocked. So we can EVA here, and you can do surface samples when you're on the ladder of a pod that is landed. So we can just do surface sample now. So that's another nine science. Not bad, right? So on board. Um, and then another thing about the aim camera. So you can reset the camera if you aim at some part, like here. Then that part's window will change to have a reset camera button. So you can do reset. OK. Close that back up. Now, there is an advanced technique um, where you can launch directly into Minmus's orbital plane. So remember, if you look right here, it's like Mun is totally flat, but Minmus is tilted at an angle. And that's part of the challenge of getting to Minmus. It does make things a little bit trickier, but it's not too hard, and I'll show you how to do it. Um, but there is a way to launch so that you're right in that same angle as Minmus. I'm not going to do it. Uh, mostly because it's just a little too complicated for this stage of the game, and uh, I want to show how to do a good transfer from, you know, like your standard low orbit. So forget about Minmus for now. Actually, let's kind of unset the target. Yeah, okay. We're going to forget about Minmus for now. Just get into low equatorial curve and orbit, just like we did before. Hit T, and then Z, and then space. And the thrust weight ratio on this rocket is pretty high, so we're going to start turning right about 50 meters per second, just tapping the D key, heading to east. As I mentioned, uh, I didn't talk about why we launched to the east. Um, the Earth, or the Kerbin, I mean, Earth and Kerbin are spinning uh, to the east. And if you launch in that direction, you can actually use some of that uh, momentum from the spin to help you get to orbit. If you launch the other direction, to the west, then you have to fight that spin, and you have to spend more dB to get to orbit. So that's why we always launch these. Okay, uh, hold prograde when decoupling, and those go. And you can kind of see how they they tilted a little bit to the outside when I decouple. That's because we moved the boosters. Click on maneuver note mode, the maneuver mode, so we can see the apoapsis and the time to apoapsis. Time to apoapsis is pretty important because if that is decreasing, it means uh, either our thrust to weight ratio is too low or we are pitched too far over. If it's holding steady, that's actually a really good sign. If it's increasing, it means your thrust to weight ratio might be too high or you're not pitched over far enough. It looks like it's staying right around 44 seconds, which is great. Uh, it'll probably start increasing pretty soon. 
as the thrust weight ratio starts getting higher and higher, uh, and that's okay. I don't think I've ever done Science Junior from high atmosphere. And since we have a scientist now, there's no harm in doing this now. So that's 22 some points of science we've just picked up. Uh, a note about the Science Junior experiment doors here. Uh, they're pretty much purely cosmetic. Even though it looks like things should be catching on fire, it doesn't actually matter what state they're in. Now this is an interesting ascent. Uh, this was a little bit more aggressive than I usually do. Um, but this is probably pretty efficient, as long as the rocket is very streamlined, which this one is. We're pitched over pretty far, almost to the horizon, and we're only at 40-some kilometers. It's going to be really efficient, but it also takes a bit longer, so it's kind of you're balancing like your own enjoyment uh, and fun versus efficiency. If you want to get to orbit faster, um, don't pitch over quite as far, and if you want to be really efficient, this is actually a really good example. Okay, AppWebs is about 80k, uh, so we're going to cut the engine and wait. So here's the other problem with doing an orbit that is uh, an ascent that's pitched over so far, is you, you have to use physical warp for your coast phase. So we're going to be sitting here for a while until I get out of the atmosphere. And once you're out of the atmosphere, you can kill time warp, and then you can start using the rails warp. It's faster. So I'm looking at the time to AP down here. It's two minutes, so I know that I'm not even really close to it yet. Remember, we're not even thinking about Minmus yet. All we have to do is get into a low equatorial curving orbit. So because my orbit was so curved, or my ascent was so curved, uh, that circularization burn did not take very much at all. So I have a lot of fuel in that stage left over. I don't think I've done the Science Junior here. Okay, we're gonna aim camera just to make this easier. Now here's how, um, the science box works. Actually, did I do this before? I can't remember. We can just collect all. It's going to move everything up there. And then we can EVA and reset the ones that we need to. Uh, this is a little bit tricky because the science junior is so far away from here. If you just tap S to move down the ladder, you should reach a point where you can restore the science junior without hopping off the ladder. It, it's going to help a lot. One other thing that scientists can do is the scientists can actually run the experiment while they're on EVA. If this was Jeb, um, he wouldn't have this button, or, or maybe he has the button, but it doesn't do anything. But Bob can actually run the experiment and then collect and restore it again. Yes, yeah, so that's another set of science I hadn't done yet. Uh, let's see here. We would need to extend the antenna. I didn't forget. And then here's our new experiment, the magnetometer report. Run that. This one can only be run in space, so you can't do it in the atmosphere or on the ground. But it's worth a good amount. Okay, well, we just collect the whole data again. That's it. All right, so how do we get to Minmus? I'm going to quick save. I haven't been doing that enough. Now, remember, it's at an angle. And these DN and AN markers here are going to show you how much of an angle and what direction they're. One way you can do this is you can put a node at one of these markers. At the DN, you want to bring normal, which is the upwards pointing triangle. 
at the AN, you would burn an antinormal, which is a downwards pointing triangle. The way you remember this, uh, antinormal and AN uh, and ascending node, which is the same sense word. Ascending node and antinormal both are, are AN, uh, and then DN is the other one. So if you right click one of those, you'll keep the number pinned, and you can drag this handle out. Now, um, this is extremely inefficient. And this is kind of where that uh, 340 number on the DV map comes from. If you launch into an equatorial carbon orbit and you want to try to match the same tilt, you can see that orange dotted line is the same tilt as Minmus's orbit. Um, while you're still close to Kerbin, it's going to cost a lot of DV. It costs, this one costs 295. There's a better way to do this, so don't do it like this. It turns out the same um, Munrise trick works for a Minmus 2. Now, this isn't a universal thing. It just happens to be how the system is put together. Uh, so don't try to do this at other planets. But roughly, if you line up Minmus with the right edge of Kerbin here, and then look at where that crossed your orbit, you can add maneuver there. Drag that prograde handle out until uh, the apoapsis is high enough. You can right-click it so you keep it visible. Oh, oh man. Okay, bring it back. Now, uh, Minmus is at 46 million, 46.4 million meters. So we want to get the apoapsis right about the same height. Okay. So it's about 46. And like, honestly, this does not need to be very accurate. Don't worry about it. But we don't have an encounter. Why don't we have an encounter? Because of the tilt, right? My orbit is going up, uh, while Minmus is going to go underneath me. That's fine. So what you'll do is you'll find the ascending or descending node on your orbit that is on the way to Minmus, and you're going to place another node there. So you can actually have two maneuver nodes. You have a lot of maneuver nodes active at once. And then here is the AN, so we're going to go anti-normal, down pointing triangle. And see, that's going to bring our orbit back down so we can get pretty close to Minmus. When these two flip positions, it means you've completely matched the plane. Okay, we don't have quite have an intercept here, and that's okay. Uh, if we go back to that first node, if we tweak this one a little bit, maybe like a little bit prograde. So now we can look at these close approach markers. Maybe a little bit of retrograde or maybe move the node entirely. Okay, there's an encounter. You can double click on Minmus to see it a little bit closer. The exact details of this don't matter that much because um, we're gonna do a little bit of correction later. Now, how much cheaper is this than doing uh, the inclination fix in low curve in orbit? It turns out the the farther away from Kerbin you are when you do that inclination change, the cheaper it's going to be because you're moving slower. An inclination change is inherently uh, changing your direction without changing your speed. It's easier to change your direction when you're moving slower, right? If I'm moving 5 meters per second in one way and I want to go turn to the left by 90 degrees, it's going to cost me like 5 meters per second times you know, cosine 45, whatever. It's like a couple meters per second. If you're going 100 meters per second forwards and you want to change your speed, direction, so that you're moving 100 meters per second to the left, obviously it's going to cost a lot more dB. Uh, so the higher you are when that uh, inclination fix happens, the cheaper it is. This one's pretty close to Kerbin, but look, if you mouse over this maneuver node, you can see the cost. It's 159. So we went from, what was it, 295 down here to 159. It's a pretty significant difference. Okay. Uh, now we're good to execute these nodes. I don't think I've actually done a node execution in this series yet. I do have uh, extended burden indicators turned on. If you hit escape, go to settings, go down here, make sure extended burden indicator is turned on. What that's going to do is add um, that very last line down here, the start burn in line. 
which is going to tell you exactly when you should start burning. There's a pretty good rule of thumb which says you take your burn time, you cut it in half, and that's uh, how long you should start before the burn actually occurs. It, that rule is pretty good. The rule kind of breaks down if your burn crosses stages because what you really want to do is you want to balance the delta V on either side of the node, not the time. And if your burn crosses stages, chances are uh, it's kind of imbalanced in terms of how much dV each stage is delivering uh, per second, right? So when you turn on extended burn indicator, you're just going to see the, uh, it's going to tell you exactly when to start burning. So you have to do any of that funky math to figure out, cut that time in half. Yeah, so we're pretty much good to go here. Uh, we can right click beyond that node, do warp next maneuver. Now we know that that's going to be pretty much prograde, so we can click that prograde hold right there. Although this ship is so big, uh, it's probably going to have some trouble turning. No, it's actually not too bad. The longer a ship is, the harder it is to turn. Uh, they do tend to be more stable in the atmosphere, but um, just because of the way rotational inertia works, if something's really big, like think about a, a figure skater, right, uh, with their arms out or tucked in. The one tucked in is turning a lot faster. Same works with rockets. Okay, I'm going to tap F to get off of prograde hold. I'm going to tilt down, so we're aiming directly at the blue marker there. Because that's for the maneuver. And then as soon as this hits zero, we'll fire the engine. Actually, I'm pretty sure it says zero when there's just under one second left. And so I time it for about a second after that. The timing, again, does not have to be perfect. And it looks like we're going to run out of fuel on this stage, which is fine. That little white bar on the uh, nav ball meter here uh, is showing you that this burn actually crosses stages. All good. I'm going to keep checking on electric charge because we don't have solar panels, uh, we only have a battery. The swivel engine that we just decoupled there has an alternator, so that was actually keeping the batteries. Oop. Right. When this meter is empty, you want to stop your burn. I went a little bit far. It's probably okay. I'm going to delete that next node too and just, uh, just redo this one. And it should be okay. So when those start to flip around, uh, you know you've kind of fixed them. All right, so that is a little bit off. I'm going to just play around a little bit with the uh, program retrograde and try and get these closer. There we go. Now, uh, we want to try and get the periapsis here as close to Minmus as we can. Uh, I'm going to use the maneuver node editor down here. So you click this. Um, little triangle button next to the thing that says orbit, so it goes to maneuver one. You click the little gizmo button here, and now you have a different representation of those handles that's a little bit easier to work with than trying to click on one of those without clicking the other ones. And you can just left click on these uh, to apply a little bit of change of, of velocity, or you can drag them just like the ones over here. You can also mouse wheel on them um, to do a little bit more precise uh, changes. The meter here on the right is the precision amount. So if you if you turn it down, then like your clicks are going to do a lot smaller changes. I would say, even though this is really cool and fun to play with, um, don't bother dialing it in like super super precisely. And the reason is, when I click this thing, I'm changing the dv on that node by 0 0.02 meters per second, 20 centimeters per second. That's a tiny, tiny amount of delta velocity. 
Um, when you're actually executing the burn, there's going to be some error there. Like you're not going to execute it exactly what the node predicts. And so there's no point in making these super precise. You want to kind of get a rough idea of when and where and how long to burn, but don't spend a lot of time making these really, really accurate because you're never going to match them with your burn. Okay. So uh, we're ready to go to that burn, I, that uh, maneuver, I think. So if you have trouble like clicking on your orbit, there is this green button here that will take you to the next maneuver, like I just did. Okay, so we're one minute roughly before the maneuver. Go aim there. And the timing on this one, because it's it's not a periapsis, it's not at a apoapsis. Um, it does have to be pretty close to that ascending node, but it doesn't have to be precise. I could start this burn right now. I don't have to wait until the start burn counter goes to zero. Uh, I'll just do it now. So you can see our orbit is coming down to meet uh, Minmus over here. And we're just watching for that flyby trajectory. Using very low throttle because very small changes to our velocity right now are going to make big differences up here. It looks like we have an encounter. Yes, okay, there it is. Ooh. Okay, let's remove this node. So my trajectory is still going over Minmus, which probably means I need to bring my velocity down, and down is usually anti-normal, this down-pointing pink triangle. But all of this is very precise. So I'm going to turn my thrust limiter down so I can uh, make much smaller changes with a little bit of throttle. Okay. Perfect. So even at full throttle, this is still moving at a reasonable speed. Because the thrust limiter is lower. And I just hit X when it's roughly flat. I mean, it's not very flat, but it's flat enough. And then remember always to turn that back up. I don't think I did the magnetometer report yet from high curve in space. So I'm going to do that now. And then I'm also going to check on the science junior. So this experiment, I had already done, uh, oh, that's nine times. Yeah. Okay, cool. This experiment I had already done once on a previous flight in this situation, but some experiments like the science junior and the Mr. U, uh, they don't give a hundred percent of their data for running it just once. They'll give like 80 or 90%. Uh, and then each time you run it, you get about like 80 or 90% of what's left. So the second time you run it, it's, it's still kind of worth a decent amount. Uh, I'll get eight science if I recover that, even though it's not, you know, like a big green bar. Eight science is, is okay. So I'll, I'll do that one. Uh, we can check the mystery view too. I think this one's probably going to be less, but it's fine. 3.5. All right. Uh, and then use the storage unit to collect all. We're in EVA, and then we have to remember, uh, reset these. Bob's having a great time. Okay. Oh, I didn't say it out loud. Um, one of the reasons why I set up the rocket the way I did with the antenna on this side and the magnetometer boom on this side, I knew that Bob would be doing EVAs over on this side. You don't want to put any fragile extendable parts near your uh, command pod hatch. Um, so extendable solar panels, antennas, radiators, whatever it is. Uh, keep them away from your patches because uh, your Kerbal and EVA will break them. They're very clumsy. Okay, so we're done with the high space science. Um, this apple, this periapsis here is still a little bit higher than I would like for landing, but that's okay. Uh, we can actually do a pretty easy adjustment right as soon as we get into the in the sphere of influence right here. So we're going to warp there. 
by by Kerbin. Oh, there's Mun too. He's flying by. And we should be able to see Mimis coming up. Where is it? No, there it is. It's very tiny. Okay, so I'll, I'll make a maneuver node just to demonstrate this. Um, you probably shouldn't use a maneuver node for this burn. You, something that gets drilled into people's heads a lot is uh, burning retrograde is how you reduce periapsis, and burning prograde is how you reduce or how you increase apoapsis. When you're in this situation, in a flyby configuration, um, you know, high up above the planet or whatever you're orbiting, if you want to move periapsis up or down, you don't want to use prograde or retrograde because those directions are pretty much straight at the planet or away from the planet. You want to use these uh, blue circles, which are radial in and radial out. So radial in is going to move periapsis closer to the planet. Radial out will move farther away. And look, that that change right there, it only cost me 6.7 meters per second dB. It's very cheap to do it like this. It would be even cheaper if I had done it uh, on my way to Minmus, but it's kind of harder to figure out like what direction you need to go. Uh, and so this way is much more predictable, and it still doesn't cost that much. Yeah, so we want radio in. We're going to get periapsis down to uh, roughly 10 kilometers. But I'm going to just delete this node and then do it by hand. So I just swing around until I find radial in, which is the blue circle with the lines on the inside. Doesn't really have to be that precise. Right click there. Okay, perfect. So this is our first time in Minmus space. We need to run all of our science. Conduct our material study. 62. Run the magnetometer. Can't run the seismic accelerometer because that's for surface. Okay, observe the mystery goo. Run the pressure data. Log the temperature. Do our crew report. Do our UVA report. Uh, let go and do our UVA science. Our old wing nut. Okay, so it's it might actually be hard to get into the hatch. This is kind of annoying. When you're on EVA, the camera there's a couple different camera modes, but they'll get locked to like a specific up and down orientation. And if the thing you want to get to is above you, it can be hard to get into it. So uh, you can hit V to change over to free mode, which keeps the body you're orbiting below you. And that will usually get you to a orientation where it's a little bit easier to get into a hatch if it was at a bad orientation with the other camera. Uh, we need to... Oh, here's what we're going to do, actually. So, I mentioned earlier um, that the science box allows a particular kind of optimization with the science experiments that don't give you full credit for a full run. And that's mainly Mr. Gu and Science Genius. So I just had Bob take the data out of those. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the pod and store them there. And then I'm going to restore and observe again for both of them. And what that's going to do is that the first one that gets recovered is going to give this amount, which it looks like you know, 75, 80% of the science. The second copy is going to give a good portion of that remaining bit. And for the science junior, that's a pretty significant amount of science. Okay, I can board here. Oops, what was that? Okay, uh, I have to lock up and board. So we now have one copy inside the crew pod, and then there's another copy sitting in these experiments. When we do our right click here up here to collect all, it's going to take that second copy out of these experiments and sort in the uh, storage box. So now we have two copies of the same data because we brought that storage box. Normally in a single command pod, you cannot put two copies of identical data. And we're going to restore those. 
uh, to get them ready for the next run. Okay, uh, next up we need to circularize. So right at periapsis we add a node and drag it retrograde. Now I usually just do these by hand, um, but it's handy to create the node, just have some idea of like, hey, how long in advance do I need to do that burn? So in this case it's 10 seconds, no big deal. We'll work down here. And since that node is pretty much retrograde, I'm going to just hold retrograde instead of trying to follow the node directly. I'll just delete the node because I can kind of tell when the orbit becomes circular. You can start throttling down as it starts to close in, and then as soon as these kind of flip positions like that, you want to hit X. Great. Well, there's our low minimus orbit. And you know what that means. It's time for more science. 100 points. You run that one. You run that one. 180 for the Magnus Hometer Boom. It's really worth getting. Wow. That's a pretty new experiment. I'm not sure which version it was released in. But I definitely didn't have that last time I played this game. To our crew report, the EVA, we do our EVA report. We let go. We do our EVA science. Uh, again, just like the Mun I meant, and Kerbin I mentioned earlier, um, if you want, now that you are in low Mun orbit, EVA reports above each different biome count as different science. So you can just hang out here and keep doing EVA reports. Uh, they're all worth a decent amount. Uh, I'm not going to do quite that level of optimization, uh, but if you feel like it, if you really want to get all that science, go for it. All right, so the data is still in there. So we're gonna, I'm doing this in a slightly different order than last time, which is super confusing, I'm sure. Uh, we'll collect all the data to the box, and then we'll EVA one more time. Restore, observe, collect, restore. Same down here, restore, conduct, collect, restore. And then this time we'll just board the capsule because now that automatically stores the stuff in the command pod. So just to check here, you can click collect all, so nothing moved. Uh, but if you click the command pod, there's four items in there. And the reason there's four items in there is because those are the things that could not be moved to the storage box because the storage box can only hold one copy of every piece of unique data. We have four copies of duplicated things that couldn't have been moved. Okay, going to quick save again. <laughs> now it's time to pick a landing zone. How long have I been streaming for? An hour? Jeez. Okay. This will probably have to be two, two episodes. All right, it's time to pick a landing zone. Um, here's one really cool thing about Minmus, another reason why it's really easy to land on. There's these big flat areas. Uh, you can kind of see here, you have like frozen lakes. Um, those are actually completely flat. If you land there, you don't have to worry about hills or slopes. Uh, they're super easy to land on. Another bonus, uh, each one of them is a different biome. So if you land here and get science, then you can hop over to this one and get science, and you can hop over to this one and get science. Uh, and then also the areas right around these flat lake beds, 
tend is, tends to be the lowlands biome in those little hills. So if you land in one of these lake beds and then hop over, just a tiny, tiny hop over to one of those places where it starts, uh, the hills start going up, you should be able to get another biome there. Then there are midlands and highland biomes and then poled biomes up here. They're a little bit hard to find. Um, so I wouldn't bother too much with those. But you want to hit a f at least two biomes. Uh, three is great. Four is even better, uh, depending on you know how much fuel you have and your appetite for tedium or practice fighting. Right? Okay, so we're going to warp over here and try and hit this first flat area. Maybe a little farther. So Mimus does rotate uh, at a reasonable clip. Mun really doesn't rotate very fast, uh, but Mimus does. Okay, we hit slash to cancel that. We're gonna hold retrograde, and here's one thing that's kind of important. Uh, when you're doing landing, you want to switch your nav all to surface mode. And this is kind of similar to uh, what I was talking about with reentry. There's a 10 meter per second difference in those two speeds. Um, it doesn't matter much here, but when you're touching down, it matters a lot. Because if you're locked to orbital retrograde, your rocket is going to be at some weird angle. Uh, and you're not going to be straight up and down when you touch down. Okay, we can throttle up. And what we want to do is have that spot where this blue line intersects the ground uh, come down right over our landing zone, right about there. Uh, if you look up here in the top left, we don't have a comp signal anymore. Um, and since Bob is a scientist, that also means we won't be able to add maneuver nodes. That's okay, because I can fly fairly well without them, and I'll teach you how to do it too. Uh, but just something to look out for. When, when the icons up here look like this, and you don't have a pilot, uh, you can't interact with, with maneuver nodes. Okay, again, quick save, probably a good idea. Also a good idea is uh, retracting this antenna. I talked earlier about how this one is breakable. When you're landing on a planet, you don't want anything sticking out that might break. Okay, let me time warp a bit. Now, the most efficient landing uh, is called a suicide burn. Uh, it's where you basically go max throttle the very last second, so you end up at zero speed, uh, at zero height, basically right as you touch the ground. It's very efficient. You don't have to do that, especially not a Mimus, um, but you really don't want to end up hovering. If you burn too early, uh, it's going to waste a lot of fuel because you'll come to a stop essentially and then gravity will start pulling you down again and then you have to fight all that speed that gravity just added. So you want to wait as long as you can. Uh, again, Minmus's gravity is so low that it's, you can wait a really, really long time. And again, you probably want to switch that to the service mode. So I'm at 500 meters per second, or 500 meters above the surface. I'm going to start that burn. You can see I could easily have hit zero meters per second. I could have come to a complete stop. And notice I'm, a, I'm on retrograde hull on surface. Uh, again, the I don't have landing legs. I could. I'm going to try to land straight up and down. But if I don't, it's actually not a big deal. And I'll probably try and demonstrate that. Okay, so another little safety burn there. Don't. Keep your engine burning for a long time. Just shut it off if you want it to fall a little faster. Uh, one, okay, I didn't really get a chance to demonstrate that. Um, once your speed drops below some threshold, it'll automatically turn off retrograde hold for you. Uh, but if your throttle's really high and you were falling and then you start going up again really fast, it might not ever catch a moment where you're going slow enough to turn off retrograde hold, and you're going to start flipping over in circles. Um, you really, really should turn off the retrograde hold before you uh, 
uh, do that final, final touchdown. I, I neglected to do it, but that's really something you should do. Okay, so I managed to land on the engine okay. Um, I'm going to quick save. And I will demonstrate just how low the gravity here is and how little you, or how much you don't need landing legs. So like, if you fell over, here I'll turn off SCS. If you were doing this same mechanic and you fell over, um, look at your nav ball, realize, okay, I want to turn left because remember the center of the blue part is straight up. So I'm going to turn left, so I'm going to hit A to turn left on the nav ball. The reaction wheel in the command pod is perfectly sufficient to just lift your rocket back up to vertical. You, cannot, you can't do that on month unless you have a lot of extra reaction wheels on there. Uh, but I'm in this, the gravity is so low, it's not a problem. And that's one of the reasons why we came here instead of month first. Okay, one thing you might want to do at this point, uh, because we've been ignoring contracts, once you've done, once you've gone somewhere new, so we've, we've actually done a few new things here. We've, we've done a Mun Encounter, we've done a Mun Orbit, sorry, not Mun, we've done a Minmus Encounter, we've done a Minmus Orbit, we've done a Minmus Landing, we've done a Flag It. If I go to the Space Center and I look at the contracts, there's a decent chance that there will be a contract for a Minmus Flag or a, like return from Minmus Orbit. Uh -huh. Nope, no luck. Okay, there may be one other one though. Let's see here. Satellites, surface outposts. No, no. Okay, no luck. Sometimes there will be, sometimes there won't. That's fine. Um, here's a fun one. I now have enough money to upgrade the vehicle assembly building. Now, the reason why that might be useful is that that unlocks uh, action groups. And since we're about to be doing a lot, lot, lot of science, uh, binding them to an action group is going to help a little bit with just the tedium of it all. So that gives us this little button over here, the uh, hammer and wrench. Quick action groups. Um, we don't, we have custom access groups, but we don't have the custom action groups yet, which are the ones that you would get from pushing the number keys on the keyboard. Uh, I can just repurpose one of these that I'm not actually using. Um, say, brakes. You don't use SAS, because SAS is actually in use, or probably even light or stage. But brakes is fine. So we're going to say, whenever I hit brakes, we're going to run all the science. There's a click on each part that has a science experiment. So the crew pod has a uh, crew port. Mystery Goo has observed Mystery Goo. The seismic acceler accelerometer has log seismic data. The thermometer has log temperature. And the barometer has log pressure data. And the science junior has conducted material study. Hey, Klaus. Um, I'm, not, I'm actually not worried about it because I still have, sorry, Klaus said don't spend all your money because you have to worry about building the next rocket. Um, I'm going to get a little bit of uh, World First rewards, both for the flag and for returning from Minmus. So that'll give us a little bit of money. And most of my rockets are pretty cheap. Uh, I think even if I didn't get that, I'd have enough. So we're going to, yeah, I think that's all the experiments, I think. So now, watch this. I hit the B key for brakes. It ran all of my experiments for me. That's a lot of science. And then again, because I have the storage box, I can just go collect all. And then it sucks them all in the storage box. And then again with Bob, we're going to do our EVA report. We're going to restore and observe and collect and restore. This may get a little bit tedious. And then fly down here. Store. Conduct, collect, restore. Yeah, and so I yeah I still have nineteen thousand, which isn't a ton. You're right, um, but I should get more once I return. It's unfortunate that I didn't get one of the contracts, but that's okay. Uh, so here's another thing. Uh, I did an eBay report. Yeah, okay. Um, 
I also have the surface samples, remember, because I upgraded the R&D building. These are worth a ton of science. And again, it's one of those experiments that doesn't give you full credit. And because it's so valuable, it's worth doing these twice. So when you're sitting on the ladder here, you can do a surface sample. And then you can just right click there and you go store. It's only going to store um, the EVA report and the surface sample. It can't store the materials view in the science junior because I already had those. That's fine because it'll get put in the pod when we get back in. And then we can do a second surface sample and just hang on to that one. So we're going to hit space and let go and float down here to the surface. And good old Bob is going to get to plant our first flag on Nimbus. So watch this, yeah. Um, the world first milestones should light up here, I think. Let's see. I thought flags was a, yes, there we go. Yeah, so that gave me 14,000 per box. So that basically just doubled my money. And then getting home again is going to give me even more. And then, of course, our good old friend, EVA Science. This golf ball is going to go flying. Don't know why we can hear it, though. Maybe through the suit. Okay. Uh, I think that's all we have to do here. Now, did it? Yeah, so it'll tell you what biome you're in. Oh, that would, okay, so the EVA re report is, or the EVA science kit is only, is not sensitive per biome. So I don't have to do that one again. Um, the EVA report is Great Flats. Okay. So when you jump, you're going to go flying. I don't even have the jetpack on. And you'll also notice I didn't bring a ladder. Uh, because it's not that hard to just use your jetpack to float back over here and hop back in. All right, so there's the first round of science done on our first biome. Once again, you should quick save. At this point, um, you need to evaluate how much DV you have left. If you look at that DV map, again, so we're on Minmus surface right now. It's going to cost us 180 to get to Minmus orbit, and then another 150 to get back to Kerbin. Probably add a little bit of, of wiggle room, uh, but that's you know 350, maybe 400. They were going to need to get home. We have 1235, which means we have plenty to try to do a hop again. You want to do a quick save. We could hop to Lowlands and then maybe over here to the flats, another set of flats. This bump up here, I, I feel like it's probably a separate biome. Uh, again, it doesn't, I, I think I might hop up there. It's kind of hard to do a long distance hop if there's mountains in your way. So I might just try and get up on top of that mountain. Now, if you look at the globe here, um, to the right is east, you know, upwards is north. Uh, that's it, kind of like an east northeast direction. And so if you look at your nav ball, you, you, you can see the north line, and then 90 is east. Uh, so we're going to want to go a little bit to the north of 90. So like maybe like a 75 degree heading. Get up there. Okay. And again, if you quick save, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, oh, one thing I didn't mention. So I'm playing without the DLC installed right now. I do own it, but I, I just didn't install it for the purpose of these videos. If you have the DLC, there's another experiment you can do and more contracts you can get actually uh, for picking up rocks on the surface. You can see some rocks over here. Um, this is actually just a thing called terrain scatter. They're just decoration. There are... Uh, There are smaller, shinier rocks, if you have the DLC, that you'll be able to pick up. And those are worth a lot of science. They're called like sandstone. There's a couple of different ones. Um, so if you see those, be sure to grab them. OK, we're going to go up to 75 heading. Um, SAS on. Now, it's not going to take much. So I'm going to actually do this in map mode here. 
Looks like we need to go a little bit further north. Okay. Perfect. Ah, time warp limits. Okay, um, oh yeah, I can talk about that. So if you're ever in a situation where you can't time warp, like your engine is firing or you're here where you're too low, uh, you can hold alt and press period to force it to into the physics warp mode, which will speed up time, not quite as much as the regular time warp, uh, but it, you know, sometimes it's all you got. So if you're doing a really long burn, um, you know, with a low thrust engine or something like that, you can use the you can force it into physical warp by doing alt period. And hopefully I'm high enough now. Okay, so once again, we're going to be practicing our landing with no landing legs. And it looks like it changed my orbit, my nav ball back to orbit mode to make sure it's at the back of the surface. If you aim, oh yeah, okay. If you aim closer to the horizon, this is more of a thing for Mun because Min Miss is just too easy. Um, but remember, retrograde is going to move away from where you're aiming. And what you want to do when you're landing is you want retrograde to be right in the center of the blue part of the nav ball, which means you're falling straight down, at, the, at least at the very, very end of your touchdown. And so if you aim closer to the horizon, then retrograde is, but in the same direction, then it's going to push retrograde up to the center of the nav ball. Just a little tip. Okay, so uh, we hit B, run all the science. We collect the science up here. I didn't even look what the uh, biome was. We EVA Bob, we're going to do our EVA report and surface sample and store the service sample there and restore this observe and collect and restore so it's ready for next time same thing down here this is a little bit tedious but i promise it's worth it okay so those two are ready uh, did I do another service sample? Yeah. So we want to do another service sample to store in the command pod. All right. We're going to try and hit this flat area over here. Uh, we first, uh, DV check where we want to have about 400 to go home. Uh, and we're at a thousand, so that's plenty. But it's basically straight to the east. Okay, east is 90 on the nav ball. Tilt over. So um, you may, if you've taken a physics class, uh, you probably learned that a 45 degree angle, let's say I want to go a little bit north actually. Um, a 45 degree angle is the best angle to throw an object at if you want to maximize the range. Uh, that's roughly true for doing these cross biome hops, um, except if it's really far, depending on how far it is, if it's really far, uh, because of the curvature of the planet, the optimum angle is actually going to be a little bit under 45, but 45 is a decent uh, angle to start with. Okay, this is the next... Uh, Flat lake, we're going to land. And once again, we are restricted from time warp. One fun thing about physics warp, though, is you can, all your controls still work. You do have to be careful because your rotation and throttle up commands and everything basically get multiplied by four. So if you try, it, don't try to do fine adjustments in physics warp. It won't work. Well, maybe I'll try and show what I was making before. So if you aim down here, it's going to push uh, retrograde up to the center of the blue. And that means I'm going to be falling straight down. 
you never want to start ascending again. Right? If you start going up, um, you burn too early or too much, and it's really wasteful in terms of fuel. Okay, press B, run all of our science, collect it all, do this whole thing one more time, EVA report and service sample, uh, store the service sample in there, do another service sample, we store this, and observe it again, and collect it again, and we store this. I think I'll probably just fast forward this part of the video. <laughs> uh, okay, and we're at 8.22. I mean, there's another flats right here. Why not? All right, it's a little bit south of east. Too far south. Good. You do want to watch out for mountains as you're doing those hops. Coming back down. That might have been a little bit of an aggressive hop. Uh, my service speed is 100. Got a little bounce there. Okay. The greater flats, much better than the great flats. Let me collect all those. EVA again, EVA report, yeah. service sample. Store the service sample up there. Do another service sample. And then I think we're not going to do any more of those. I'm not going to bother resetting them. And we're ready to head home. So that was four biomes, I think. Greater flats, higher minimus, higher minimus, space new minimus, space new minimus. Great flats, midlands. Oh, I could do lowlands. Right there. <sighs> okay. Yeah, we'll do one more. Wait, I don't want to do that. Okay, uh, we want to go to the west, which is 270. up on just that little hill side there. How are we doing on power? Hmm. 
a little bit low. Oh, it looks like it overshot a little bit because Mimis rotates underneath you. And again, you don't want to burn too much too high up. It's just wasting fuel because gravity will pull you back down again. Um, one thing about the these boulders, you should know, uh, they don't actually have physics. Because they're they're totally optional. Uh, you can land on them or through them, and it's fine. All right, so um, turn the SAS off. Okay, lowlands, good. That's what we wanted. EBA report and surface sample. This is actually a little bit dangerous. It should probably come to a stop. You just don't want anything getting bumped too hard. Okay, so this, I haven't talked about this before. This will pop up if you happen to pick up a piece of science that's already in uh, whatever thing you're trying to get into. It's okay, generally, to just hit dunk. Oh, I, I managed to put them both. Um, because if, if that pops up, it means you have two copies of something, and generally that's not really worth that much anyway, so you don't have to worry about dumping it. I'm trying to maximize uh, returns, and I try to split them up a bit. Okay, uh, I just hit quick save, which may have been a mistake. We know that it should take about 350 to get home. We want to launch to the east. Uh, 90 on the nav ball. So I can actually kind of turn this uh, until we get to about 90 and then pitch up. Just like that, using the good old reaction wheels and go. So you want to keep a pretty low pitch here. Uh, obviously, fly over any mountains you see. Keep an eye on your apparatus, kill it when it's about 10 to 20 kilometers. Doesn't take a lot. Really, not a lot. And we're going to try and warp here. And of course, because we're too low, it's going to be all annoying. What was the height? There we go. Okay, warp to AP. Um, yeah, okay. So, gonna burn prograde to circularize this orbit. It doesn't have to be too pretty, just don't make it too big. You can go low throttle here, and you should see the periapsis pop out. As soon as those start to swap places, you kill the throttle, and we're good. 18 by 19. We have 219 meters per second left. According to the DV map, uh, it costs 180 to get home, so we should be okay. 
I'm going to hit F5 real quick. Uh, and then finally, there may be a contract waiting for us for returning from Minmus or from, for science from Minmus. So I'm just going to check for that real quick. Nope. Sometimes, oh, it looks like these haven't refreshed yet. Um, so Bob is in stable orbit around Minmus. And if we time warp uh, a couple days, we're going to get all new contracts. Let's try that. What do we got? Uh, no. Yeah, unfortunately, nothing interesting. Whoa, that would be a fun contract to do. That's a huge amount of money. So some of these contracts you'll get eventually are um, doing a specific experiment on the surface at a few different locations on a you know, distant body. Uh, these are actually usually really good excuses to build a rover. These you have to hit a couple, several different points on the surface. Rovers don't really work that well on this. Um, you're better off just hopping, kind of like I've been doing. Use the low gravity. But this is a great, great contract. Uh, that's a ton of money. A lot of science. It would be really fun to do. Um, and you're at the point of the game now where you can kind of just do things for fun. Uh, you know, like like we did at the start. Like I didn't have a contract to amend this. It just happened to be the, the right thing to do. Um, but if you see stuff pop up here that look really fun, uh, you should grab them. All right. Back to our flight. Uh, okay, I still don't have a comm signal, and the reason is because my antenna is retracted. Okay, now I have one. Now, it, it's all important to note, um, if you're on the far side of Minmus, like if Minmus is blocking your line of sight to Kerbin, uh, you probably won't have a comm signal, and you have to wait to get around. You can set up relay antennas or relay satellites to make that work. Uh, you're just... If you're wondering why you don't have a comm signal, just check to make sure there's no planet in your way. So, um, if how do you get home? If you treat Minmus like a clock, and Kerbin is at 12 o'clock, then you're going to want to put a node right around maybe 2 o'clock here. Right? So it's, it's kind of towards Kerbin. It's not, it's not at the point that's closest to Kerbin. And it's not at the point out here in front, but it's sort of in the middle. And you're going to drag your prograde handle up until you get an escape there. And you're going to watch this periapsis, handle, periapsis node and keep dragging that prograde handle. Oh, I hit the mine. Nice. Um, what you should see is the apoapsis here should stay roughly right at Minmus's altitude. As you, as you drag that program handle. If you put this node um, a little bit too late, like there, what you're going to see is the apoapsis here is going to start going above Mimis's altitude. Or if you put this node too early, like here, um, it's going to be, apoapsis is going to be higher on the other side. You'll know that this isn't the right place because apoapsis uh, will be roughly right, uh, it's right there, uh, roughly right at Minmus's altitude. Okay, and as you drag this program handle, you might also you might need to move it slightly if you see uh, the apoapsis going higher, and that's okay. Uh, this burn is expected to cost. Uh, let me check the DB map again real quick. Uh, it says 150. Okay, so we should put at least 150 meters per second of program on this node. Remember that TV cost is right here. Keep dragging that so it says 150. Right, and so now you see the AP is too high right there. So let's move this that way. Seems a little better. Right, and so the curve and periapsis which is what we ultimately care about. We want to try and get that down to about 30 kilometers. Can't select Kerbin. Okay, double-clicking on Kerbin, this can get a little bit easier. Oh, now notice 
this orbit is tilted, right? And partially that's because Nimitz's orbit is tilted, partially it's because uh, the orbit that I took off into is tilted. Sometimes it can help you to, if you're having trouble getting the periapsis here low enough, it can help to play with the inclination, and your orbit is tilted, it can help to play with the inclination a bit. Let's see here. Okay, so you can go this way. You just kind of play with it until you see uh, it flatten out, and the, hopefully this number should get lower too. Right? Now I can drag some more prograde, and that is coming straight down. This is another situation where, um, you know, you can use the node to kind of figure out when and where and how much you want to burn, but then ultimately you really want to look at your actual trajectory and not the node prediction. But it looks like we're ready to go. Um, that burn is in 1 minute 20 seconds. It's always really hard to click on Kerbin in this situation. Uh, you can hit tab to cycle the camera focus through different points. And you can actually so focus on maneuver nodes, which is really the only way that you can kind of get like a custom, um, custom camera in map mode. You can put a maneuver node anywhere you want as long as it's on your orbit, and then you can hit tab to focus the camera there. It, sometimes it's useful. Anyway, if you click, keep hitting tab, it'll cycle through all the planets. I want Kerbin. Okay, um, right, so this maneuver direction is slightly off of prograde because we drag that uh, anti-normal direction. So I'm going to try and keep pointing at that blue marker. And we're looking at that start burning indicator down the bottom right. It's a little bit of time warp because so I'm impatient. Hit the zero. You should generally start these burns at full throttle, but then, um, you know, as they're getting close to finish, you should throttle down so you have a little bit more control. Right. Delete that, and now I can keep pointing the same direction and just watch this actual periapsis. 18. Okay. I think that should be fine. Um, I've said it before, such a light ship, you can get surprisingly aggressive with your arrow braking. Anyway, I, I quick saved, just in case I'm wrong about that. Um, now I can time warp. And remember, you don't want to crank up the time warp to get down here, because uh, you'll probably go too far, especially because in such an orbit like this, uh, you're going to go faster and faster and faster as you pass the periapsis. It's better to just kind of click down here and do warp here. There goes mine. Oh, we're already in the atmosphere. Okay, hit retrograde, stage that off, switch to service mode, close this. Wah! Okay. Oh, the antenna might break. That's okay. So remember, um, you want to manually switch the nav ball to service mode when you're re-entry. If you notice the, diff the angles are slightly different, uh, Remember, the, the air is stationary to the surface, and so if you're in service mode, then you're going to be oriented directly into the wind, whereas in orbit mode, you will be slightly off. Yeah, so I can even use um, physics warp here, and the, the pod is not having any trouble holding that position. Uh, it's perfectly safe. The parachute was already staged because I put it in the same stage as the decoupler. So it's going to deploy. I'm trying to think if there's any other science I can do in here, and I don't think there is. Maybe if this is some different biome on the surface, but... Uh, 
I guess I can just hit the B button to figure out. B button? Oh yeah, there's new science. Grasslands. EVA report, service sample. So service samples, even from Kerbin, are actually worth a lot of science. Um, and I, th I think the reason is because you don't get them until you unlock the uh, research and development building level two, which is pretty expensive to do. Uh, but if you're playing a science mode game, you have that available right off the bat, and you can get a lot more science just by harvesting stuff from the surface on Kerbin. OK, we're going to cover Any guesses on the amount of science? Yeah. <laughs> that that's a lot. And again, we, we made a little extra money because we were doing things that we've never done before. Even though we didn't have a contract, you get money from those world first rewards. Oh, now we get the plant flag contract. So if we had gotten that one in the middle of that mission, I could have picked that one up and got some extra money. It's no big deal. So yeah, we can unlock a ton of stuff here, but that's going to be for later. This is the end of this episode. Thank you so much for stopping by if you're watching live. I'll see y'all later.